appreciate that. Appreciate everybody getting up, uh, getting going here. I know it's a long weekend for everybody. Uh, my name's Brent Vandervoort. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. I own a company called Fat Man Fabrications. Uh, confuses people a lot of times where that name came from, but uh, here it is. And we do hot rod suspension and chassis. Um, I, I have a maybe a different idea about seminars. If you want to talk about Fat Man Fabrications and my products, that's what the booth we paid for is inside the show. My purpose here is not that in terms of any competitive things. And, but there'll be times when I'll talk about my product or heights or something the folks at Speedway make or Detroit Speed because they have a particular product that's applicable to what we're talking about. But this is really about the design principles. I do have a mechanical engineering background, but learned to drive on a Model A when I was 16, and that's like 44 years ago now. So I'm trying to find a way to combine theory and education and reality. And there's times when theory and the reality don't always agree. It's, that's because the theory is wrong or the theory is being misapplied, which is often the case. Um, that said, I like to do this pretty loose. I'm a pretty informal guy. Uh, ask a question, I'll repeat it. I'll promise you that any question will be treated with all the respect it's due. And uh, ha let me have some fun with this. I have a basic track I run on. I can't tell you everything I know in an hour, and there's a lot of things that I don't know. So we're not going to cover all of this subject in an hour in any way, shape, or form. But you guys will ask some questions along the way, hopefully, and that makes it interesting for me and I think more for other people. So uh, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Taking care of housekeeping. Uh, we've all had a morning cup of coffee. There's a bathroom right across the way. I won't take any offense if you need to take a walk for a minute. So be cool with that. Uh, and with that said, we'll just kind of jump in. Okay, hot rod, chassis, and suspension design principles. The core thing is this arc length theory. Guy down there. And really, this is the core of about 80% of what we're going to talk about. And even when I was in engineering school, they never really defined this. It seems pretty intuitive, uh, something that would come to you naturally, but it's really important that you understand this arc length theory because it's going to affect how any kind of linkage works. And you'll be surprised how similar a rear four-bar suspension really is to an independent front suspension. You're just looking at it from a different angle. Because any kind of four-bar linkage or radius rod is a way to control the motion of an object. If you've ever had the misfortune to bend a, hood, bend a hood hinge on a car, it no longer goes in the hole it's supposed to and scratches the fender. Well, that's because bending those links shortens that link, and it no longer puts the hood where it's supposed to go. Same basic thing happens with a suspension, be it front or rear. But the, the key to this thing is this arc length theory. And when you have a, a radius rod this length, it has a cord. It runs in a big circle. That's why it's called a radius rod. And as it goes up and down a certain distance, it has a certain effective length change measured from the center line of the pivot. This is the change right in here. Now, as you can imagine, and I'm sure you know, as that gets longer, this length change is different. Simple thing, but it's so important. It's the core of what's going on. This can work for us, and this can work against us. Arc length theory. Good example of this seems to really be able to get people connected in this is let's do a pretty simple chassis, Model A frame. You know, they're flat on top, pretty straightforward deal. And let's say that uh, our, our intrepid hot rodder has gotten a really nice digital level last Christmas and it's time to build the chassis and use this thing. So the first thing he does is he sets the chassis up level front to back, side to side. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise hands because I'll bet you over half of you do that when you build a chassis. And it's your first big mistake and it messes you up from then on. Yes, you can compensate for it. I used to think that was a good idea. And when I was building one chassis back in the days we even used stick welders over MIG welders and TIG welders like we do now, I could weld flat better than I could overhead like most people. And I did some work on the chassis upside down and it worked so well that when I put it right side up again, the rack and pinion steered the wrong direction. You know, and it worked great upside down. But these compensations, not only are you wrong, but you're double wrong, because if you should have gone minus two degrees and you should have gone plus degrees, now you're off four degrees. Now you're off in a mess. And you're going to see constantly how this basic thing affects you. There's even a page further on that says truisms that aren't true. I don't know if we'll get this far, but this is the biggest thing I've been hammering on. Even I got Sarah Dono in Street Rider magazine saying, you know, I'm seeing that now. And you're starting to see articles that talk about this. But hey, let's get back to the subject. Well, 
Okay, so our hot rodder, he sets us up, and he heard or read somewhere that four bars should be parallel to the ground. Because we don't care about the level of the frame. That's not what we're talking about. It's how it relates to the ground is really the issue. So he sets up his four bar level, and that's all great. And he gets the car done. And every time he's on the interstate and a tractor trailer goes by him, this Model A goes left and right and all over the place. You know, the non technical term is it's squirrely. But he's getting something called roll steer. Because when he's finished, and the car sits on a three degree rake, which is pretty typical on a Model A. Now, this arc, this length, is no longer vertical. So what happens is, we're making, a, I always talk about a left turn, just to make it consistent and easy. If you get a left turn, your body rolls right. What's really happening is, the axle is moving up towards the frame on the outside of the curve, and away from the frame on the inside of the curve by the body roll. So what it does, it actually takes it off center. Your axle is going to cock so that it creates more oversteer. Your wheelbase will become shorter by maybe an eighth or a three sixteenths on the left side. But remember, we got double the effect. Now your axle may be out of square three eighths of an inch. Now, if you build a chassis with the axle out of square three eighths of an inch and you weren't going to turn left all night at the local bull ring Saturday night, this car would always want to turn left, wouldn't it? It's obvious to see. So this is what happens. And now what happens is, He's going up the road straight, something happens, the road curves, the road cambers, the tractor trailer blows him off the road. First the car goes to the right, he corrects for it, then it goes back, and he's correcting back and forth. Now sway bar will help this a lot, but better design would have eliminated the problem. So we can correct this. Now, I'm a private pilot, and they call it pilot-induced oscillations. It can keep going so far that you finally lose the car, and you end up laying it on its side on the interstate, which merely makes for a bad day. So we can avoid all this. If you set it on that two, three degree rake when you start, now you set the bars level. This line of action is vertical. Yes, the axle moves back and forth in the chassis. It has to. That's why you have a slide joint at your U-joint. Okay? But the axle stays square in the chassis. No more roll steer. Very simple thing, but a great application of how that works. Now, I'm in NASCAR country. I run around with a guy named Tommy Johnson. You may have heard of a old NASCAR crew chief called Harry Hyde. And the movie Days of Thunder is basically Harry Hyde and Tim Richmond, the driver's story. And uh, Tommy's told me he was there for all that stuff, and he says everything in that movie happened, everything, and a lot more that you'll never see in print. Didn't all happen the same day in the same race, but the popsicle story, you hit the pace car, all these things happened there. But he talks about this, and uh, he explained to me, he says, it's really easy to keep straight. He says, if you're coming up to a corner and you go through it nose first, you're understeering. And if you go through a tail first, you're over, you're over steering. And if you go it upside down, you're roll steering. He says, that's how we used to keep it straight. This is going to create roll steer. But by having this chassis on an angle to begin with, we're simulating the final rake is the whole idea. This affects your alignment. You can imagine if you set up your caster in the front with the frame level, and then you put the nose down three degrees, what would you do? You lost three degrees of caster, didn't you? Now you got this crazy shim stack in there or your straight axle has a problem where you can't get it straight up the road because you set it up for seven degrees cast, now you only have four. Things like this catch up with you. It's a basic fundamental thing that affects how it functions. I'm getting a lot of nodding heads. Everybody along with me there? Elemental, but it's absolutely critical. Great. So how does this affect suspension? Um, trying not to tell too many war stories, but years ago when I was Let's see, it would have been about 74, I had a gas station. I bought a little 64 Falcon sedan delivery, thought I'd make a cool delivery car, took out the six and the skinny 13-inch tires, put in some of those great big six-and-a-half-inch wide Ford GT wheels, you know, running uh, bias ply belted tires back then. 7,000 miles later, I got bald tires. So I put the car in the air, and I got an inch-and-a-half of tow in so in the middle of cussing the alignment man, and he's going to buy me a new set of tires, I go ahead and I crank out the tie rods, and I reset the toe, and I put it back on the ground. You know what I got now? I got an inch and a half of toe out. Fortunate to have a friend named Lou Parks. He won the giant uh, mechanic award at Indy one year, uh, does some racing with a guy named Foyt out of Texas these days with his Indy cars. And I called him up, and I said, what's this? And he said, now you know what bump steer is. And that's how I ended up standing here. My I had found out what bump steer was on one of the first worst factory front ends ever designed. The 67 Camaro is right after it. There's a lot of stuff wrong with it. But these things can be fixed. So we're going to take you through a little quick walk through front suspension and what's going on. 
Now, the earliest suspensions were ah, 39 Chevy, uh, 41 Plymouth, getting into the 49, 53 Fords. Basically, what you see is a short level upper arm, long level lower arm. Okay, when you get weight transfer, this car's coming out of the page at you, making a left turn, body rolls right. I've exaggerated the camber change. It's, a, it's in the order of two, three degrees, but to get the point is the outer wheel's doing the right thing. You learned early on, learning around a bicycle, you lean into a turn, right? What that does is transfer your center of gravity into the turn, and that's why you don't fall over and get knees full of gravel. The outer wheel, or the inner wheel, excuse me, is actually doing the wrong thing. It's cambering negative. Now, uh, this is not a good thing. We're basically getting no traction out of this wheel, uh, especially with bias play tires. Radial tires can roll and keep the traction patch a little bit better, but you're in great shape here. You've moved your center of gravity in. This is out. It really doesn't handle that badly, but it's pretty limited. Um, and then the 60s came along. A muscle car thing starts happening. You may or may not realize that the 67 Camaro, for instance, is based on, that suspension is based on a 64 to 72 Chevelle. It's the same spindle with a rear steer steering arm instead of a front steer steering arm. This used to trip up a lot of guys back in the subframe days. They'd find a Nova Camaro drum brake subframe, and then they'd find a Chevelle spindle with disc brakes, and they'd just bolt the whole thing on. They'd have a lot of bump steer problem because now the tie rod is two and a half inches higher than it's supposed to be. And it also has Ackerman reversed. Those are things hopefully we'll talk about. But you need to keep the steering arm with it. But they all had the same basic problem of a relatively short spindle. And you see the upper control arm's running downhill. Lower control arm's still level. You've all watched IndyCar races. You see this very clearly. You see the front suspension is level on the lower arm. Upper arms are inclined down towards the center of the car. If you think a minute, you'll recall that. That's a superior suspension because... When this body roll occurs, we're actually moving around. Uh, we're moving around our pivot points. We're not really moving the ground, but we're moving the pivot points on the chassis due to the body roll. You see, so now we got trouble. Both wheels are cambering the wrong way, and there's a page in here, in your handout, where you'll actually see that. These are pictures taken on a road course. There it is, right there. There's a.